Those of you that have been in the sessions that I've had the privilege of sharing with you, we've been talking about the nature of faith. We found out that, first of all, we've been dealt the measure of faith, and that God expects us to increase that measure. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word. Or as the literal text says, faith comes when Christ speaks and you hear. In other words, when Jesus speaks and you hear it, or you hear what he says, faith comes. I like to just paraphrase it and say, Christ speaks, you hear, faith comes. Christ speaks, you hear, faith comes. Somebody said, well, the problem is, is Jesus still talking? Yes, he's still talking. The word says in Hebrews chapter 1 that in these last days he has spoken unto us by his Son. And I can't find anywhere in the scriptures where the sons quit talking. He's still preaching, praise God. Jesus is not a retired preacher. He's still preaching. He's just using more bodies than he had before. He only had one body when he was here in the flesh, but now he's got a multitude of bodies. And thank God they will yield their voice unto him, and he's speaking. I just want to tell you something. He's speaking this morning. Jesus is talking to you. Somebody said, you calling yourself Jesus? No, I'm not calling myself Jesus necessarily, but I am his vessel. Hallelujah. And I have loaned him, I've given him, actually not loaned it, given him my spirit, soul, and body. And so he's going to talk to you this morning out of this tabernacle. So he's never quit talking. And when Christ speaks and you hear what he says, then faith comes. Everybody say this. Christ speaks. Christ speaks. I hear. I hear. Faith comes. Faith. Now I want you to say this, Satan speaks, Satan speaks. I, hear. I hear, faith goes. Faith goes. It's that simple. Christ speaks, you hear, faith comes. Well, it ought to be, you know, very clear to you that you ought to be listening to Jesus rather than the devil. Amen. Christ speaks, faith comes, if you hear what he says. So we found out that the measure of faith will increase. As faith comes, as, as we impart God's Word into our spirits, then our measure of faith begins to be increased. We found out there are levels of faith. No faith or faithless. Little faith. Great faith. Exceeding great faith. And then we begin to talk about the nature of faith, how it operates, its characteristics. We said that faith sees. Faith sees. That's the first thing that faith does. Faith sees beyond the problem. Faith sees beyond the circumstances. If you're governed by what you can see with these eyes, then you're limited. The Apostle Paul says that we walk by faith, not by sight. In other words, he's saying we are not governed by what we can perceive with our five physical senses. If you're always saying, well, I believe I'm healed when I feel healed, then you're limited because you probably may not feel healed all the time. But thank God if you can look beyond the problem, then you have a position of advantage over the adversary. Satan is dealing with this natural realm. And if he can get you to be governed by it, then he'll limit you and you'll not enter into the high life. But thank God we walk by faith and not by sight. So faith sees. Faith sees beyond the problem. Now the only way that that can happen is that you have to go to God's Word and let the Holy Spirit become an artist. And he'll use the word as the oil. And he'll use your spirit or your heart as the canvas. And when you go to the word and you begin to meditate God's word and you find scriptures such as himself bore my sickness and carried my disease, if you'll meditate that and if you'll utter it and you'll say it and you'll say it and you'll say it and you just keep meditating it, you'll notice that the spirit of God will begin to paint an image on the inside of you of you being healed. And you see, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. When you have an image of divine health in here, sickness and symptoms will not stay on your body. The problem with a lot of people is that, you know, they know the Bible says that they're healed by the stripes of Jesus, but they haven't conceived an image of it. You must conceive an image, a faith image. Conceive a faith image of what the Word says. And once that image is conceived on the inside of you, then you're in a position of advantage because you can see things that other folks don't see. You can see things that, that other people have no idea what you're talking about. I remember several years ago, Carolyn and I, we were just getting a hold of these things, you know, and man, we were driving an old dog car, had over 100,000 miles on it. I used to be a paint and body man, 
And I bought this old O's 98, 64 O's 98 luxury sedan. It's total wreck. Somebody wrapped it around a tree. I didn't know what it's like to own a car that hadn't been wrecked. In fact, if somebody had give me a new one, I'd had to go tear a fender up and fix it before I knew how to drive it. I'd never owned one that hadn't been wrecked. And so this old car was, you know, a total wreck, and I bought it and rebuilt it. And it was good looking. I mean, man, you didn't have a scratch on it. You couldn't tell it had ever been wrecked. Good looking car. Only problem was it's worn out. It had over 100,000 miles on it, transmission bad. And, and you know, it's just, it's just worn out. It looked good, but it wouldn't run. And so, you know, it didn't take long for that thing to uh, begin to die on us. And we got smart real quick, decided, you know, we need another car. And we started believing God for one. And in the natural, it's impossible to get it. But we started believing God for it. And God blessed us with another car. And we put several thousand miles on that one, and it came time for another one. And I remember one time I was coming back from Oklahoma City. I, I performed a wedding there in Oklahoma City, and I had to get back in town to leave on a meeting with Brother Copeland. And so we drove in the wee hours of the morning, you know, and we was coming across that freeway between Oklahoma City and here and got out there in the middle of nowhere, and I run over something in the highway, a pipe or something, and it, and it flew up under the car and knocked a hole in my gas tank. And I just filled the car up, and here we are out in the middle of nowhere, and I'm watching that gas gauge just, just I mean, sitting there watching that thing. Gas was pouring out of the bottom of the, of the fuel tank. And so we managed to get to a service station. The guy let me use his rack, and I plugged up that gas tank the best I could, and we made it home. And so when we got home, you know, the next morning, of course, that plug didn't, hold, didn't work too good, so I had to call uh, a wrecker service. They come and got the car. And my neighbor across the street, she happened to see, be out in the yard when the car was towed off. And I don't know, bless her heart, she just didn't understand us. And we'd already prayed and believed God for another one, see. And my neighbor came across the street over there and she said, uh, well, I see your luck's about like ours. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, we had problems in our car too. They towed it off too. I said, well, in the first place, don't believe in luck. I said, that don't bother me. I believe I got another one anyway. She said, you want? I said, I believe I got another car. She said, where is it? I said, I believe I receive it. She said, but where is it? I said, well, I believe I receive it according to Mark 11, 24. She said, but where is it? I said, I believe I receive it. Well, if you got it, where is it? I said, I believe I receive it. And she just, you know, had a hard time understanding that. And I'd tell her about Hebrews 11, 1, that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Not seen. You couldn't see the car I believed I received. And she wasn't willing to believe anything until she could sit in it. You know what I'm talking about? And so she just kept on. I mean, you know, every time I'd run into her, you got your car yet? I said, I believe I received it. Well, when you gonna get it? I said, I believe I received it. And finally, you know, she told me one day, she said, I can't believe things I can't see. I said, that's obvious. I said, but in reality, you can. You just don't think you do. I asked her if she believed she had a brain. <laughs> Amen. She said, well, of course I believe I've got a brain. I said, how do you know? She said, I know I've got a brain. I said, when's the last time you've seen it? You know, some folks have seen theirs, I think. Take it out and play with it every once in a while, you know, the way they act. <laughs> she said, well, now, I got a brain. I said, well, how, what makes you think you've got a brain? She said, because I know I have a brain. I said, but how do you know? She said, well, I, everybody has a brain. I said, but how do you know you hadn't seen it? You just got through telling me you can't believe something you can't see. And you've never seen your brain, and you have the audacity to go all over town telling folks you've got a brain. And it's hard to convince some. Sometimes it's hard to convince folks you've got, you know, what you laid hold of with your faith. I quit trying to convince people a long time ago. I don't, whether, I don't care whether anybody else believes it or not. You know what I'm talking about? You get in trouble trying to prove to everybody else that you, you know, you believe you got this or you believe you got that. I really don't care whether they believe it or not. 
but they can't argue with the results. Amen? I mean, when you're driving it, they can't say, you ain't going to get it. It's there now in the natural where they can see it. But she kept on with this and kept saying, I, I just can't understand that. Well, I kept explaining to her how faith sees beyond the circumstances. I said, the car is not here in the driveway. I can't see the thing. I can't go out there and touch it. I can't, I can't ride in it. But faith is the evidence of things not seen. I said, now I know the thing exists, but it, just because I can't see it doesn't mean that it does not exist. A lot of people think that, you know, this faith realm thing is a fantasy world where you just play like things really are and you play like things really not. You know, some folks think that it's just kind of a fantasy world where you just pretend certain things. It's not fantasy, it's dealing with facts, the highest form of reality that exists. God's Word is truth. Amen. But she couldn't understand how I could see something that she couldn't see. Well, you remember all those angels that the prophet saw that his servant couldn't see? Well, just because his servant couldn't see them did not mean they weren't there, did not mean they weren't real. I can't see the Holy Ghost right now. But he's here. I know he's here. I can't see him. I can't reach out there and say, how you doing, Holy Ghost? He's here, though. I can't see my angel, but I know he's here. I can't see your angel, but they're all here. This place is full of angels. Hallelujah. I can't see them, but they're all here. Amen. Just because I can't see them don't mean that they're not real. Faith sees beyond the problem. In fact, it became so real to me that I had another car. I could see myself driving it, praise God. Now, she couldn't see me driving it. She saw me without a car. But I could see beyond that, praise God. And I remember the day the thing manifested. I couldn't hardly wait to go knock on her door. You know what I'm talking about? She couldn't argue with the results. It's kind of like years ago, my youngest daughter, Terry, wanted a piano. She said, Daddy, let's pray that God will give us a piano. I want to learn how to play the piano. So we all agreed and believed God she received a piano. And so she'd come in there one day and she'd say, Daddy, we believe we got a piano, don't we? I said, yes, ma'am, we sure do. She said, and I'm going to learn to play it, ain't I? And I said, yes, you're going to learn to play it. She said, and we're going to put it over in that living room, aren't we? Yeah. And she said, Jesus gave it to us, didn't he? I said, that's right. And she'd go on off and play and she'd come back in a little while. She said, Daddy, we believe we got a piano, don't we? I said, yes. She said, we're going to play it right over in that living room, aren't we? Yeah, Jesus gave it to us, didn't he? Yeah, he sure did. And she'd go on, that had gone for days. I mean, days. Daddy, we believe we got a piano, don't we? Yeah, we got one. Jesus gave it to us, didn't he? Yeah, we, yeah. And one day she'd come in, she said, Daddy, we believe we got a piano. I said, yes, we believe we have a piano. She said, Jesus gave it to us. I said, Jesus gave it to us. She said, how come we don't ever play it? <laughs> well... She had to learn faith sees. <laughs> faith sees, hallelujah. Faith sees. You ever lived in a home with no furniture? Faith sees. It's <laughs> the way my wife and I started in this town with nothing. Everything we owned, we had it in the back of that old blown Oldsmobile car. Moved in that little old dump we was in over here. Dear God, you had to see beyond the circumstances. You ever ate off, slept on, and sat on a television set? You ever been in a home with no refrigerator? <laughs> no stove? And confessing you live the abundant life? We have. And thank God we don't, or we're not without a stove, refrigerator, and all that stuff now. Because faith works. Faith sees, praise God. Faith sees beyond the circumstances. Faith sees beyond the circumstances. We talked about the fact that faith sees. When you conceive an image in your heart of, with God's Word, then you can see the answer. I can see certain things right now that, that, that I've got my faith out for. I can see it. I can see me with it. Now, in the natural, it's not here yet. But you see, I'm not worried about it. I'm not under pressure about it because I can see it in here. I know that what I have need of does exist because faith is the evidence that it exists. If you've got evidence for something, then it exists, whether you can see it or not. Amen. 
If I was to tell you, I have a 1927 T model. Somebody say, you do not. I do too. Well, where is it? Just because you can't see it does not mean that it doesn't exist. Amen. Now, if they'd let me, I'd drive it up here and show you. But you see, what you ought to do is just take my word for it. Why would I want to lie to you? A lot of people won't take God's word for it. They think he's just, you know, putting on. He's just telling us stuff. Well, God says, he shall supply all our need, and I see me with my need met. Hallelujah. God says that I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus, and if some kind of symptom tries to come on my body, I look beyond the symptom, and I see me healed. I can see Jesus bearing what the devil's trying to put on me, and if you can see in here yourself living in divine health, that symptom cannot stay on your body. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So faith sees. And we found out that faith speaks. Once that image is conceived in your heart, then because you believe, you will speak. The apostle Paul said, I believe, therefore have I spoken. Whatever is in the abundance of your heart, that's what you're going to talk. And if you're always talking, I never get my needs met. I'll never get out of debt. I'll never be prosperous. That's what's in your heart. And the reason it's in your heart is because that's the image you've conceived. Some people cannot see themselves getting any better. Some people have a hard time seeing themselves ever being healed. There was a man that was in, uh, set by the pool of Bethesda. For 38 years, the man was lame. Now, you know as well as I do, if you've been lame for 38 years, it'd be a little bit difficult for you to see yourself any other way. If there's no hope for you to ever recover, if there's absolutely no way that you could ever be healed, then you know that it would be difficult for this man to see himself any other way. And Jesus realized that. And the Bible says that heaviness in the heart maketh it stoop, but a good word will make it glad. And Jesus realized that if he was ever going to get this man out of that condition, he was going to have to, first of all, change the image in the man's heart. He had a defeat image. He had a cripple image. He had a lame image. The only reason he's down there at that pool, it was just the last thread of hope that he could hang on to. But even there, he didn't expect to recover because Jesus asked him, will thou be made whole? And the man said, you don't understand. I don't have a man. And even if I did, it wouldn't help because somebody always steps in the pool ahead of me. So what's he got? A defeat image. He didn't expect to recover. But he sat there by that pool as just a last thread of hope. And so Jesus realized that the man was not only sick physically, but he was sick on the inside too. He had a defeat image. And Jesus always ministered to men, spirit, soul, and body in that order. He reached the spirit man first and he changed their image on the inside. The Bible says a good word will make it glad. What's the greatest word that a man could hear that's been lame for 38 years? Rise. And so Jesus spoke that good word that made his heart glad. And immediately the man began to get a new image of himself. Jesus said, rise. And then he said, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately this man's image was changed on the inside. He could see himself getting up even though he'd been crippled for 38 years. Jesus said to his spirit, rise spirit man, change your image on the inside. He spoke to the man's soul and he says, change your attitude soulish man. Quit seeing yourself being carried around in a bed. Start seeing yourself carrying the bed. And then he told his body, now you walk, body. And his spirit rose, his soul changed his attitude, and his body got up and responded and walked. Hallelujah. That's the way it works. You have to conceive the image on the inside. And once that image is conceived, then you'll talk it. It won't be a matter of trying to talk it or having to talk it. It's automatic. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So faith sees, and faith speaks, and then faith acts. You see, when you've got that image on the inside of you, and you're speaking those creative words out of your mouth, then you will act accordingly. Faith sees, faith speaks, and faith acts. Now yesterday we asked this question. What do you do when you've conceived the image? You're talking it, and you're acting accordingly, and it looks like nothing's working. Well, that's the next part of the nature of faith. Faith stands. Everybody say, faith stands. Faith stands. Faith stands. Say it again. Faith stands. 
Turn around and tell at least two people, when you've done all to stand, stand. All right, let's turn over there to Ephesians 6 and look at this. Ephesians 6. In verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now he's telling us to be fully dressed in the armor of God. He says, finally, in conclusion, in other words, when you've done everything else, finally, stand. A lot of people say, I've done everything I know to do. What do you do next, Brother Jerry? Stand. How long till you win? When do you win? When you don't have to stand no more. How do you know when you don't have to stand anymore? When you got what you was believing for. When do you get it? When you don't have to stand anymore. Amen? Amen. Having done all to stand, stand. So evidently one of the, the, the characteristics of this God kind of faith is that faith sees, faith speaks, faith acts, and faith stands. Now I want you to turn over to Hebrews chapter 10 very quickly. Hebrews chapter 10. This is one of my favorite verses in Hebrews 10 verse 35. It says, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after you've done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now notice it says, cast not away therefore your confidence or your faith. Cast not away your faith. You see, this is what happens a lot of times when you have done all you know to do and you're standing on God's word. That's probably the greatest opportunity you'll have to compromise. That's when the devil tries his game. That's when he tries to create circumstances to get you to fold up and quit and cast away your faith. You see, if he can get you to take your faith off the job, or let's put it this way, if he can get you to remove your faith from the mountain, then there's no resistance to the mountain. If he can get you to back off from the problem, because you've gotten weary, or you're tired, or slothful, or lazy, or mad at God, or whatever. If he can get you to take your faith or remove your faith from the problem, then there's no resistance to the problem, and the problem will overtake you. As long as you've got some resistance out there, then thank God you still got a chance to win. And you know, with the Phillips translation literally says in Ephesians chapter 6 where it says, and having done all to stand, stand, the Phillips translation says, and when you have fought to a standstill. You know what a standstill is? That's when both opposing forces refuse to move. That's a standstill. When you have fought to a standstill, the Phillips says, stand your ground. Amen. Stand your ground. Now, I want to tell you something about the adversary. He is a compromiser or a loser by nature. He don't want you knowing that. And as Ed, you get to that point of the standstill, I mean, you got your faith up against the mountain and Satan is standing there bowed up and telling you, I'm not moving. You're going to lose. And you've got your faith up against the situation. You're telling him, I'm resisting you and you're going to flee. And he's telling you, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. One or the other is going to compromise. Somebody's going to give in. Amen. That's true in all kind of warfare. 
I mean, you get two armies out here in some nation somewhere fighting. There's been many times that, you know, in, 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 in warfare, that, that two opposing forces have fought to a standstill. They're trying to take the same territory. And one of them's on one side of the mountain, one of them on the other side, and they're both firing at each other and both determined that they're not going to give ground. But always somebody gives in. Always somebody will give in. They'll get overpowered. Or they'll begin to operate in fear and, 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 and conceive a, a defeat image and retreat. Well, that's what happens to a lot of Christians. The devil's standing up there and made up his mind he's not going to budge and you've made up your mind you're not either. One or the other will. And what the devil would love to do is create enough pressure on you when you've made your stand, create enough pressure and one of the ways that he knows that he may be able to get to you when you've done all to stand, if the attacks themselves are not getting you, you're standing there quenching every fiery dart, then the thing that he knows may get you, in many cases, is get some sincere Christian to come talk to you while you're standing about what happened to them when they were in that place. And brother, right then, that's when you need to, to put earmuffs on your helmet of salvation. Well, you can't hear that. Man, you don't want to lose any ground and you go to listen to that and you start losing ground. You won't reinforce. What you ought to do is call all the Caleb's and Joshua's you know and have them to get in there behind you, praise God, and get someone to help you hold your hands up, get you on a greer, hallelujah. Reinforce, listen, it's nowhere where it says that it's not fair to gang up on the devil. Dear God, when I've done all the stand and I'm standing, I don't want some negative person coming telling me that this is not gonna work. What I wanna do is get a hold of a Joshua, a Caleb somewhere. I want me somebody that'll come in there and agree with me and, and join with me, praise God. One can put a thousand a flight, two can put 10,000. What I'd like to have is a wall of believers, hallelujah, standing ground with me, hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. So I said, what if you can't find any? Then stand your ground. You and God's a majority. Amen. It says, stand your ground. Well, you see, the devil's a bluff. You ever met a bully? I used to run into a lot of bullies. Of course, I wasn't always a big hunk of man I am now. I used to be little, you know, and so it's always somebody trying to bully you. And I learned something one time about a bully. They're all mouth. They're bluffs. There's a guy by the name of Herbie Johnson when I was in elementary school. Herbie was bigger than the teacher. I mean, that guy was big. And here I was, man, I weighed, well, you can appreciate this. I graduated from high school weighing 100 pounds. No, I didn't get a scholarship for fullback at Ole Miss either. A hundred pounds, I left high school, went into it at 90. So you can imagine what I looked like in the first grade. The second grade wasn't much better. And so, old Herbie was a bluff. He was a bully. He was always shooting his mouth off. And you know, one time, I called his hand. I was made to. My daddy had given me some foreign coins from Okinawa and Japan and different places when he was in World War II, and he gave those coins to me, and I took them to school one day in a cigar box, and oh, I was the center of attraction. I had those coins with those funny inscriptions on them, you know, and everybody was looking at these coins. We sitting out there on the playground, and I'm showing my coins. Boy, I was having a time. And old Herbie pushes his way through the crowd, reaches in there and gets him a handful. Says, what are you going to do about it? I cried. Oh, he ate that up. Put them coins in his pocket and walked off. Next day, did the same thing. He finally got almost all my coins. I come home one day and had my cigar box there flipping my one coin. My dad said, where's your coins, boy? I said, Herbie got them. He said, who's Herbie? I said, is that big old boy down there at the school? He said, what'd you do about it? 
cry. <laughs> he said, did you let the boy take your coins? Yes, sir. You didn't do anything about it? No, sir. Why? I said, Dad, you ain't seen Herbie. <laughs> he said, boy, I want to tell you something. You just think Herbie's bad. You wait till I get a hold of you. <laughs> he said, I don't want you starting fights, but you better never run from one or I'll whoop you. Now, I don't know whether that's the best way to train a kid or not, but that's the way we used to do it back then. But he said, you don't run from a fight. I said, but Dad, you don't know Herbie. He's bigger than a teacher. He said, you get your coins back or I'm going to whoop you. Well, I went to school the next day and I'm sitting out there on the playground by myself flipping my coin. I ain't got nobody interested anymore, you know. And Herbie walks up and grabs that last one. And when he did, there's a crowd gathered. Now Herbie bows up and says, what are you going to do about it? I said, give me back my coins. He said, get them. I said, Herbie, you better give me back my coins or you and I are going to fight. I thought, why did I say that? <laughs> I don't want to fight that guy. And I, you know, I got to think, I don't want to do this. You want the box? It's a nice box. You can carry them in, you know. I don't have to have your pockets bulged. You want my box? And I kept thinking, I ain't going to fight him. But then I kept thinking, I got to go home tonight. Which would be worse, Herbie or Daddy? And so I said, Herbie, give him my coins. He said, take them. I said, I'm going to tell you one more time, give him my coins. He said, take them. And then this thought came to me. I've never seen Herbie fight. Nobody would ever seen Herbie fight. He just said he was bad. And everybody believed him. Nobody. Herbie never had a fight. He just bullied. He just pushed and talked big. And nobody had ever fought Herbie. And I thought, how do I know he can really whip me? He looks like he can. He talks like he can. But he hadn't proven that he can. And so I drawed up there, you know, and I said, Herbie, you put my coins in the box or you and I are going to fight. And he just stood there laughing at me. And while he's laughing, I caught him off guard. And I took all 47 pounds. <laughs> and put it all in my left wrist and fist. And I jumped off the ground like a kangaroo. I had to, all I'd done was just work his shins over good if I hadn't, you know. You don't give me them coins, I'm gonna bruise your shins, boy. <laughs> I had to jump off the ground to hit him in the head, you know. And I just jumped and when I did, I threw all of my weight, what little I had, in my left hand and caught him right in the mouth. And when I did, he knocked him down and he's on the ground. And it surprised me. I didn't know, he, I didn't expect him to get on the ground. And I thought, well, while he's down there, I might as well make the best of this. So I just jumped right in the middle of his chest and just went at it, you know. <laughs> and he was crying, begging me to get off of him. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Do you know Herbie and I went to school together all the way through about the 10th grade? Herbie never changed. I never changed. I didn't never get as big as Herbie. He played football, big old bruiser, you know, and he tried that mess all the way through school. All the way through school. He's always bullying folks, but he never bothered me again. <laughs> never. 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 I found out that's the way the devil is. When you've done all the stand and he's telling you, I ain't moving, and you're telling him, yes, you are. God's word says resist you and you will flee. And he said, no, I won't. Yes, you will. He's a bluff. He's a bluff. All he wants to do is to, to convince you that he's not leaving. And if you fall for it and run off, then you're the one that loses ground and he gains ground. All you got to do is take your sword and bust him in the mouth and when he hits the ground, just jump right in the middle of his chest and take the rhema of God and let it come out of your mouth like rapid fire out of a machine gun and he will flee from thee in stark terror. Hallelujah. He's a loser by nature. Amen. 
Anybody that's already had damnation passed upon them is a loser by nature. He knows he can't win. He knows his days are numbered. He knows that his future is not too bright. A lake of fire. He just tries to bluff his way into this. You have to stand your ground. Stand your ground. A lot of people don't have no idea what we're talking about when we talk about stand our ground. They give up on a hangnail. Oh, dear God, I, this stuff don't work. This has been hurting for 30 minutes now. They have no idea what we're talking about. One lady told me one time, said, Brother Jerry, I confessed it three times and nothing happened. Three times. I said, boy, you're the rock of Gibraltar, aren't you? <laughs> three big times you confessed it. I'm telling you, you're solid. Some folks don't know what standing's all about. You know why? We've been programmed by the world to be quitters. We've been programmed by the world when it gets tough, quit. Well, faith stands. Everybody say, faith stands. stands. You'll notice here he says, cast not away therefore your confidence. It has great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience. Oh, that's a word some folks don't like. Patience. That's got them tired of being patient. That's all I do is be patient. I don't want to be patient no more. God, I want this done now. I'm being patient. But when are you going to do it? You see, the reason we don't like the word patient sometimes is because we've got a warped definition of it. Some people think patience means just put up with that problem till one day in the sweet by and by it'll be better. Jesus never put up with any problem. He dominated them. Jesus never tolerated the devil. He controlled him. Patience means to be consistent. It means to be constant. It means to be never changing regardless of the circumstances. The man that is patient is a man that will say, my God meets my needs according to his riches and glory when he needs one million dollars or whether he has a million dollars. He won't alter his confession. Amen. A patient man is just like God. The Bible says that in him there is no variableness, neither shadow of changing. God says, I change not, either shadow of turning. I change not. And that's the way the body of Christ has got to become. The devil says, well, what are you going to do now? Did you notice that little dart I threw in there? And you just tell him, I change not. I have declared what I believe and I change not. I declared that my God meets my needs and I'll change not. I am not afraid of evil tidings. My heart is fixed, established, trusting in the Lord, and I will not be moved until I see my desire upon my enemy, praise God. You change not. He says, after you have stood, you have need of patience. Don't cast away your faith. If you cast away your faith, there is no resistance to the problem. And I want to tell you something. Listen to me closely. A lot of people use their televisions as a refuge from pressure. And the only problem is, when all the movies go off, you still got the pressure. A lot of people think if they can't stand the pressure, they just go to bed. But when you wake up, it's still there. Somebody said, well, I've been confessing the word and it didn't do any good. Oh, yes, it was. You may not have been able to see it in the natural realm, but in the spirit realm, your angels are at work, praise God. Your angels are at work. The Holy Spirit is at work. The word is out there doing your fighting. Your faith is out there chewing on that mountain, praise God. Amen. Don't use the television set or the bed as a refuge from pressure. Go to the word, hallelujah. God is our refuge, praise God. God is my refuge. When you're under pressure, don't run in there and try to watch a television show to get the pressure off you or go to bed or go read the funny papers. Go to God. Let Him be your refuge, praise God. And all the time the devil's creating this pressure, God's telling you, come on, boy, you can do it. Hallelujah, you can do it because I've equipped you to do it. And He'll encourage you and not discourage you. Amen. Faith stands. He says, don't cast away your confidence. We have need of patience. Turn over to James chapter 1 very quickly. Brother Copeland mentioned this last night. In James chapter 1, 
You'll notice that James says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this. Now, you won't be able to count it joy when you're being tested if you don't know verse 3. The trying of your faith worketh patience. The trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now, let me tell you what that literally means. He says that when you are under attack, when Satan is trying your faith, first of all, he said you need to maintain an attitude of joy. Don't you let the devil discourage you while you're under attack. Don't you let him steal your joy. If he steals your joy, then he'll get your strength. And if he gets your strength, then you're weak. And if you're weak, you're not going to be able to resist. So he tells us, first of all, you must not let anything, the pressure or anything else, get you joy. He said, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, testings, and trials, knowing this, the trying of your faith will put to work patience. In other words, God has put a trigger mechanism on the inside of you. Faith is released, and once your faith is released, Satan comes immediately to try your faith. But God has a counterpart for that. When the devil tries to try your faith, then God has caused a trigger mechanism to go off on the inside of your spirit and it will release patience or consistency. In other words, the trying of your faith will loose patience to come in there and support your faith. You understand what I'm talking about? And in other words, he's saying, if you let patience have her perfect work, in other words, if you will let patience do what it's designed to do, cause you to be stable, unwavering, consistent, constant, never changing. If you'll let patience come in there and support your faith and cause you to maintain stability, then it says you will be perfect entire, wanting nothing. If you don't want nothing, you must have got what you was believing for before this test came. Amen? You don't want anything, you must have got it. Amen? He says, let patience have her perfect work. All right, now notice this. He says, your faith is being tried. That triggers patience. It should, but see, a lot of people, they, they don't know how to respond to it. The pressure comes, and they fold up and quit. You'll notice here that James says that you can't waver. You have to become single-minded, single-minded. You have to become single-minded on what you believe God's Word is saying you can have. And don't let anybody talk you out of it. I learned a very valuable lesson from Brother Copeland. Well, not one. I learned many valuable lessons from Brother Copeland, but one in particular that he shared with me a number of years ago, and I believe he told me that Oral Roberts shared it with him. He said the key to the su success is to find out what the will of God is. Number two, confer no more with flesh and blood. Number three, get your job done at any cost. And that confer no more with flesh and blood, I want you to know that is a dilly. Boy, you need to get a hold of that. Once you have made your application of faith, then you be cautious about who you listen to. People try to talk you out of it. Amen? He says, the trying of your faith will put to work patience. And if you'll allow patience to have its perfect work, you'll be entire, perfect, wanting nothing. He says, but you can't waver. You become single-minded. Let me read a translation to you from this in James verses 6 and 8. It says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. The Weymouth translation says, being a man of two minds, being a man of two minds, in other words, one side he's saying, my God meets my needs. The other side he's saying, oh, dear God, I'm going broke. One side he's saying, my, uh, I believe I'm healed. And the other side saying, no, we don't feel healed. One side he's saying, uh, you know, I believe my wife's going to get saved. Another side he's saying, she's getting worse, she's getting worse. A man of two minds, it says, is undecided in every step he takes. Did you hear that? A guy that wears suspenders and a belt, he, he's probably double-minded. <laughs> you know, could be. I don't know that for a fact, but he could be. You know, he's undecided in every step he takes. Somebody said, it's just a safeguard, brother. No, you don't want to bring the world system into God's system as a safeguard. 
God's system needs no safeguard. Hallelujah. It works. Amen. Like one woman told me one time, said, Brother, would you pray? The Bible says lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. If you'll lay hands on me, I believe I'll recover. I laid hands on her and prayed and I said, tell me what you believe. She said, well, I believe I'm healed, but do you think I ought to go get a hospital room just in case? I said, yes, ma'am, if I was you, I'd go there right now because you're going to need it. She's double-minded. Unstable. Unstable. Everybody say unstable. unstable. Everybody say John Osteen. John Osteen. <laughs> that guy has you repeat everything, don't he? <laughs> unstable. Unstable, it says. A double-minded man is unstable. He's like a wave of the sea tossed to and fro. Faith stands. Faith is consistent. Faith is not moved by the circumstances. And you'll notice that when you get unstable, then there's no consistency in your life. When you get double-minded, you'll waver. You're, you're unstable. And a lot of people walk through life that way. It's kind of like this, you know, like, a, like a, a, a wave on the sea that's being tossed to and fro, just being tossed to and fro. People are like this. One moment they're saying, my God meets my needs. Next moment, oh, dear God, I'm going broke. I believe I'm healed. Oh, I hurt. Oh, I'm getting saved. No, I'm going to hell. Oh, my kids are responding to God. No, they're going on drugs. And you walk around in life like this all your life. There's no stability in this. All it takes is a good win and you're finished. Can you imagine going to the office this way every day? How you doing? Oh, my God meets my knees. About an hour later, dear God, it hurts. Oh, I'm going broke. And you just walk through life like this all your life. That's not stability. Stability is having both feet on the rock. Hallelujah. The rock of your salvation. Amen. You're a piece of the rock. Hallelujah. So faith stands. Everybody say, faith stands. faith stands. Then we found out that the, the, the remaining two characteristics of the nature of faith is once faith stands, faith rejoices. Everybody say, faith rejoices. faith rejoices. You see, praise and thanksgiving after you have prayed and you're standing on God's word, praise and thanksgiving is the highest expression of your faith. A lot of people wait until the manifestation comes before they ever thank God. That's backwards. You thank God the moment you pray. If you believe you receive, that would be the highest expression of your faith. You see, you speak, you act, you stand, you rejoice. The Bible teaches us that we ought to abound in thanksgiving. I had somebody tell me one time, well, you know, I'm so strong in faith. We don't do much of that praising anymore. I said, no, you're ignorant. It's what you are. The Bible says that believers ought to abound in thanksgiving. Abound in it. Man, the stronger I get in faith, the stronger I get in praise. Because praise is the highest expression of faith. I rejoice after I pray. Not when I can feel it. Not when I can see it with my natural eye. Not when I'm driving it. I praise him the moment I pray and I stay in praise. Hallelujah. Praise is what keeps the enemy uh, uh, stood still. And praise is what opens the door to the blessings of God. The Bible says that praise will cause the earth to yield her increase. Hallelujah. If, if Brother Copeland come in here and said, Jerry... As soon as the service is over, I'm going to buy you a suit. I'd walk up to him, shake his hand, and say, Thank you, Brother Copeland. And I hadn't even got it yet. My thanksgiving was an expression of my faith in his integrity. Now, what would you think of me if I walked up here and I said, Brother Copeland, just as soon as you get me the suit, I'm going to thank you. He said, I wouldn't get it. That's exactly right. And what makes you think you're going to get it from God if you act that way? That's rude. If Brother Copeland tells me he's going to buy me a suit, then I'm going to walk right over there and hug his neck and shake his hand and say, thank you, and then as soon as the service is over, I'm going to be in his car. Because <laughs> I happen to know where it is. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You understand what I'm saying? I'm going to thank him, praise God. So faith rejoices. 
Faith rejoices. Faith rejoices. Faith rejoices. Somebody say, well, it's not working. Why should I rejoice? Oh, yes, it's working. Rejoice. 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 Oh, yeah, the devil, <clears throat> the devil will come in there and say, what are you praising God about? You so dumb, you can't even see you don't have it yet. I say, that's what I'm praising God about. You said it, you're dumb. I got it by faith, hallelujah, and you can't stop me from getting it. Hallelujah to Jesus, I believe I receive. Amen. Faith rejoices. Faith begins to praise God. That drives the devil up the wall when you're thanking God for something that it don't look like you've got. It drives other folks up the wall too. Let them hang there. You can come back and get them after you. It's manifested, praise God. Faith sees. Faith speaks. Faith acts. Faith stands. Faith rejoices. And finally, faith Rest. Faith rest. Turn over to Hebrews 4, quickly. Hebrews 4. Look at verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. Do you get that? For we which do believe enter into a rest. Some folks just continue to struggle with their faith. They never enter into that rest. It's because they don't let the nature of faith, the characteristics of faith, the cycle of faith, if you please, be operative in their life. Once you conceive the image and you can see the end result with the eye of faith and you begin to speak it and you act accordingly and you stand and you rejoice, then you'll enter into a rest. I mean a rest. You'll have a consuming assurance that it's yours and the struggle's over. You go on to bigger and better things, praise God, knowing for a fact that it's yours. The devil will come in there and try to, you know, bother you about it and you can just laugh at him. I'm not even going to talk to you about that devil. That's mine. That's mine. I, I, I don't even have a care about that. Just enter into the rest of the Lord. Now, I want you to notice it says this. Look at verse 11. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. You have to labor to rest. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Now, once you notice, evidently there is a point in your faith where the labor part is over and you rest. But you don't rest until you labor. The laboring part is conceiving the image. I mean, you may have to walk the floors a few nights confessing God's Word until you get that image on the inside of you. Somebody said, well, that's my problem. I don't like getting up at night. Then just go on and lose. You're not desperate enough to win anyway. There are times when I just, I just absolutely refuse to go to bed until I can conceive that image in my spirit, man. I'm going to have this. God says it's mine. If I have to stay up the next few nights to do it. Now, I don't always have to do that, and I want to leave that impression. But if that's what it takes, then I'm willing to do it because winning's the name of the game. And particularly if it's dealing with my life and my family and my ministry, I'm not going to go in there and go to sleep when I can change a few things in a few hours by conceiving the image, praise God. And so I will labor to enter into that rest. There's times when you lay down on the bed, you lay your head on the pillow, and the devil, it's almost like he just straddles you and starts telling you it ain't going to work, it ain't going to work, it ain't going to work. There ain't that much money in the world. You'll never get it, you'll never get it, you'll never get it. That's when you have to get up and go labor. Walk in there in your prayer closet and take your Bible with you and just go to confessing God's Word. I've got up at times and the, and, and, and the devil trying his best to put something on me. I remember one time a toothache that was about to take my head off felt like, man, that was bad. I'd rather had any kind of pain than that. It was terrible. And I'd, I'd lay down there and it felt like my head was coming off. And man, I got up and it hurt to even talk. It hurt to move my lips. 
But I walked in there and got the Bible and started reading the Psalms. Started out with Psalm 1 and read all 150 of them. And dear God, I want you to know it takes a while to read 150 Psalms. One of them's got a lot of verses. But I want you to know when I got through with the last one, the pain was there no more. And when I got up the next morning, my jaw was swollen up. I looked in the mirror and my jaw was swollen up. I thought, dear God, what's going on? And I reached out there and I couldn't feel anything. It was just like I'd had a shot to deaden the pain. And I felt and stressed and I couldn't feel any pain. I, couldn't, I had no feeling in that side of my face. And I immediately started resisting the devil. And the Spirit of God said, don't do that, it's not him. He said, I have performed an operation on you. He fixed an abscess tooth. I went to the dentist and he said, man, you must live right. I said, I do. He said, ain't no way you can tolerate that kind of pain. Yeah, I labored to enter into that rest, hallelujah. And God did a miracle on my mouth. Well, there was some labor involved. But thank God there comes a time when the struggle's over. You just know that you know. I'm fully convinced the, the things that Brother Copeland's preaching us in the evening services, particularly where Abraham offered Isaac. There was no struggle whatsoever. Why? He was fully persuaded. When you get fully persuaded, you rest. The struggle's over. The struggle is over. Say it with me. Faith sees. Faith, sees. faith speaks. Faith, speaks. faith, speaks. faith acts. Faith, acts. Faith, re faith, stands. faith stands. Faith rejoices. Faith rejoices. And faith rests. Now let me close it with this. My time is about up here. <laughs> it's funny. Most musicians get requests for songs. I get requests for sermons. When I sing, everybody operates in faith. You can't be moved by what you hear. <laughs> Brother Copeland won't let me sing on here. So, I get requests for sermons. That's not to say that Brother Copeland's are not any good. I just wanted to correct that because he's sitting right over there. He gets requests for sermons too, singing and everything. The Lord gave me an illustration of the life of faith that if this don't get it across to you, you're just not listening. It's like going upstream in a canoe. Amen. It's like going upstream in a canoe. Everything's against you. In the natural, there's no way. Right? But thank God you can do it. If you get on the Word of God, all things are possible to him that believeth. The Lord shared this with me one time. He said, it's like going upstream in a canoe. I said, God, just, you can't go upstream in a canoe. He said, if the salmon can, you can. You're creating a higher class than he is. Amen? And he showed me this. He said, what happens? He says, the world is on a negative stream. The end thereof is destruction. When a man is born into this world, he begins to live like the world. He's, he's spiritually dead. He can't help it. And so he, he's following this negative stream. And the only thing that can, that can turn his boat around is good news, the gospel. When a man is converted, that's exactly what happens. He turns around. Amen? When you're converted, you go another direction. And so what happens is you're going downstream, following the rest of the world, living like they live, but thank God the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And someday, somewhere, you finally hear the good news. <clears throat> and the moment you hear that you can be saved and that you can become a new creation, you can be delivered from that negative stream that you've been following. You can be delivered from a destiny of hell. Then faith arises on the inside of you. But you cannot turn that thing around just by wanting to just by agreeing that that would be the thing to do, you have to put forth some effort. And it's like having to get the 
paddle out of the bottom of the canoe. Did you notice going downstream in a canoe, you really don't have to paddle all that much because the stream, the force of the stream will carry you its direction. But the moment you make the decision <clears throat> that you're going to make Jesus Lord and you're going to live by God's Word, you have to get that paddle out of the bottom of the canoe and start turning this thing around. And I want you to notice that it's not easy to turn a boat around when it's going downstream. And you finally get it at about this angle and you're at a 90 degree angle with the stream and this is perfect position for shipwreck. You got the stream beating up against your ship and it's hard to get that thing around. And here you're thinking, dear God, can you ever get it around? This stuff's hard, I can't do it. And you throw your paddle down and your canoe gets turned around. You love God, but you're living like the world. You're sad, depressed. Brother Hagin comes to town. Teaches you, you can have what you say. You hear about his meeting. You paddle into his seminar. <laughs> and brother, he goes to preach and you come alive and you think, dear God, I'm gonna live this way. And you start turning that thing around. And here you go again, 90 degree angle with a stream. But this time you said, I can have what I say. I can have what I say. I'm going to get this thing turned around in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I got it. Don't quit paddling now if you do. Amen. You finally get this thing turned around here and the stream's beating up against your ship and all the trash and everything's coming your way and you can see all them obstacles. Obstacles, like Charles Cap says. <laughs> Here comes the obstacles. <laughs> and you're thinking, dear God, that thing's headed right for my, my, my ship. Dear Lord, ain't no way you can do this. My God, I'm going to die. And all the time you're operating in fear, nobody's paddling. Your boat gets turned around. You still love God, still going to heaven, but you're living like the world. Brother Copeland comes to town. Tells you how to get this thing upstream and keep it there. Dear God, I like that. <laughs> and you get it going upstream. Here comes the obstacles. But you're thinking, no, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm not moved by what I hear. And the obstacles pass you by. Hallelujah. And you make it, hallelujah. And you're headed upstream here and you're thinking, dear God, you can do it. It ain't the easiest thing I've ever done, but you can do it. And most of the time, it starts off with a little woman. She's up here paddling this thing, and her old man sitting in the back back there don't believe nothing. <laughs> He's griping at her, fussing. Why don't you just let life be? You fouling up everything by trying to go that way. You're shaking the table, I'm losing my beer. Everything was running smooth, going the other way. And then you get religion. What's all this trash up here in the boat? Copeland tapes. <laughs> Who's Copeland? Where'd you get all them books? You've been spending my money. I don't work like I work to have you spend it on somebody's book. What do you know about life? Bless God, this is life. And she's trying to paddle this thing and he's getting to her. And finally she says, I can't take it anymore. I'm going to bust him in the head. <laughs> All the time she's busting him in the head with her oar, nobody's paddling. <laughs> Strife will turn your boat around, folks. And then she gets condemned. Fred Price comes to town. <laughs> He's preaching on the love of God, how to win your husband. Dear God. <laughs> gets this thing turned around. Headed upstream. Oh, husband's still fussing and a griping, and she just turns around there and says, love never fails. Things which are seen are subject to change. That means you, Jack. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Just keeps a paddling, praise God. 
And here she goes, paddling upstream. Her old husband sitting back there not believing nothing. Both kids about to drown. They on drugs. They don't know where we're going. <laughs> Hanging. She's having to keep them in the boat and paddle at the same time. And here comes an ark from the first church downstream. And here she is struggling along. And the captain of the ship, who happens to be the pastor who's coming downstream, says, Lady, you can't go that way. We know we tried and we almost died. And she's thinking, there goes the first church. They're not going this way. Dear God, you must can't go this way. He said, that's right, lady. We left half our members shipwrecked. Faith stuff don't work. Did you notice the hose in our ark? We've been through the fire, the flood, and the mud. <laughs> and she's thinking, he can't do it, and they can't do it, I can't do it. And gets this thing turned around again. John Osteen comes to town. And he tells her how to hold fast to her confession. And she gets this thing turned around, heads upstream. Next thing you know, some unsuspecting believer pulls up alongside of them, encourages her. While this one's encouraging her, some little old woman's back there witnessing to her husband, least likely to win anybody to the Lord, and turns that old man on, man. And he taps his wife on the shoulder and says, Sweetheart, I am now in the kingdom. I have my own paddle. Let me help you. And he walks up here to the front of the ship and starts stroking this thing, man. And boy, they going on. Hallelujah. They going on. And she's back there paddling. They got two of them paddling now. She's still keeping them kids in the boat. But everybody's paddling up front. And finally, somebody wins them kids to the Lord and the whole family's paddling upstream, praise God. Next thing you know, they're dangerous to the devil. So he has to send an obstacle. <laughs> the old man's got a pain. Oh dear God, I'm hurting. but he's not moved by what he feels, and he keeps paddling. He says, my God, this word says by his stripes I'm healed, and I'm going to keep paddling anyway, and this act healed, hallelujah. And the devil can't get him. He gets this healing down pat. Man, the whole family's living in divine health, but they're nine notes behind on the canoe. <laughs> Hello? but he learns how to give his way out of debt. Praise God. Learns how to give his way out of debt. Next thing you know, the whole family's paddling upstream. God's enlarged their boat. It's filled with goodies. And they're heading through life. Upstream, when everybody else said you couldn't do it. Then one day, you're paddling along here. You got your faith out against every mountain. And you're just resting. It don't seem like there's any struggle to go upstream anymore. The Spirit of God will put a big sail in your boat and a rushing mighty wind will blow it forward and you'll find out the paddling's not as hard anymore. I'm convinced in these last days God's going to make our canoes jet propelled. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Well, stand up and give the Lord a shout. Praise God.